So some biographical facts. Michael Oakeshott was born in London in 1901 and he died in 1990. His father was a member of the Fabian Society, many of whose members founded the Labour Party and the society's leaders founded LSE, the London School of Economics. Um, I, th I read at some point that in his youth, he was somehow attracted to socialism, but not mm. in the economic sense. He was interested in this idea of the romantic revival of spirit, because at the time, many people thought that non-socialist paradigms have nothing to give us. They mm. are, in a sense, culturally deficient mm. and spiritually deficient. And I think that this is partly because their advocates were really hesitant to enter in moral debates. Mm. And I think that this raises some interesting questions that we could reserve for the end as to whether we should engage in moral debates in politics or we should abstain from them. But let us keep that for the end. Um, he studied history at Cambridge and he became a life fellow at 1925 at the age of 24. He served in the British Army from 1940 to 1945. And then he became a professor of political science at LSE in 1951. He did teach in Oxford and Cambridge uh, before, mm -hmm. but that was where he got his professorship, I think. Uh, and there he launched a, uh, an annual lecture of series in the history of political thought. And as they said, uh, initially he was talking about canonical figures, but then he started talking about, he, f he really focused on ancient Greece, ancient Rome, medieval Christianity and early modern history. Mm. So some of his major works are his 1933 experience and its mode, modes, that is not political. Uh, he is talking there about how his, we can have a historical understanding of experience. Mm. It's a really interesting book. I haven't read it. I have read some small parts of it, but I would like to revisit yeah, it yeah, at yeah. some point. Here is uh, where his connections with British idealism are somehow uh, more evident. Right. I don't think we can count him as a British idealist, but he was really influenced by that mm -hmm. movement. Okay, then another uh, influential work is Rationalism in Politics and Other Essays, which is a collection of essays that he published in 1962. Both of the essays we're gonna talk about today belong to that series of lectures, of essays. And then he had a book called On Human Conduct, which he published in 1975. Okay, so let us move now to rationalism in politics. Mm -hmm. I want to say that Oakeshott is really good in pointing out the precise target of his writings. Um, he is not someone who uses words without qualification. And part of his lack of haste is that he is, is his, I would say his desire and his, him taking the time to show the reader precisely the view that he's attacking. Mm. So what, despite the title rationalism in politics, he's not attacking every form of rationalism. No, it's specific in, in politics. Yes, but <laughs> even there, he is talking about specific kinds of rationalism mm. in politics. So he is really clear about not attacking the Plat Platonist view of rationalism or the scholastic rationalist position. He's attacking a particular early modern conception of rationalism that he, as he points out, is evident in thinkers that we do not put in, assign regularly to the rationalist camp. Mm. And he says that the two most evident specimens of his... Um, of uh, what he calls the rationalist temperament are Bentham and William Godwin. Mm. Uh, I don't think, uh, we can definitely not say that Bentham was uh, an epistemic rationalist in the Cartesian sense, but this actually yeah. makes it more interesting to see how a particular mode of thinking captured the whole but, age. Yeah, the, I, I totally, uh, totally agree with this as well. Um, and this this is why I've been spending a bit of time thinking about how would one actually define socialism, because it seems to be the rational organization of society uh, along a priori principles. 
uh, which is obviously the opposite of tradition. And I think that's that that that's a very broad um, definition. But I mean, socialism seems to have been a very broad movement. You get lots of people like John Stuart Mill saying, "I'm a socialist, but I don't want any of the things that socialists are usually attributed with having." And yes. so, and then on the other side, you've got people like Marx who are extreme uh, socialists. And yet they all operate on this same set of axioms where, no, no, if if we just have the right idea, we are now justified in taking control of all of society and reformatting it to our desires and how it should be. And that, I think, is the essence of socialism. And that, that seems to be like the, the ultimate um, rationalist project. That seems to be the, the politics of rationalism, like laid yeah. bare. I am a bit cautious about this. I realize I've I've made some very sweeping statements there. No, no, no. I, <laughs> like, I, I, I do think there is there, but I, I'm I'm worried about not about the substance of what you're saying, mm. but I'm worried a bit about the formulation because mm. I think that we are really much conceding to the left mm -hmm. some notions that we shouldn't. Right. Okay. So I do agree with you. This is the the end goal that socialists are about. It's to my mind, socialism is supposed to be the stage that prepares the advance of communism. Mm. Communism being the end state, mm. socialism being the means by which mm -hmm. communism will be achieved. There is this idea of irrational planning. Mm. I think that's the major part that uh, that socialism involves. But I, I think that when we say this is a rational planning, I think that we are a bit, we, we may be giving the term reason and rational to the left. And I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not prepared to do that. Maybe down the, down the line, I change my mind. But at the moment, I, I think that yeah. we should, that we are giving way too many concepts to the left and problematically. The, like the, there seems sorry to interrupt, but there, there seems to be a need for us to connect this to the concept of managerialism, right? Yes, yes. Because I agree with you that obviously, I mean, you know, someone like Oakshot is obviously very reasonable and yes. has, is very rational in his faculty. Yes, but and so when he's applying that to his analysis of politics in the world, um, you know, I don't want to say well he's now forced to claim to be irrational yes. when he's making his judgments, yes. obviously. Um, but he's not a managerialist, as in yes. he, he doesn't it, – because one of the, the – it's the systemic thinking of socialism that allows them to conscript everything in civilization to their side, and at least in, it gives them license to do so if they can find the power to do so. Whereas someone like Oakshot or a conservative w would accept that there are things that belong to other people that they yes. don't have a right to. I think we could go further in defining the socialist idea because the it's not merely planning mm. and administration, it's top-down implemented planning. Mm. It's a top-down implemented and imposed order. Mm. Whereas we could say that tradition does involve an order oh, that yeah. is not imposed from the top down. It is sort of spontaneous. spontaneous. Yeah, yeah. It arises from yeah. the bottom up. Yeah. by people engaging in particular practices, mm. in particular ways in which they engage in each practice. And I think Hayek had a nice example in uh, he gave, although mm. he did not count himself as a conservative, but I think... No, that, neither does Oakshaw count Hayek as a conservative. Yeah, but <laughs> I think that this was a good uh, example. He was saying that, let's imagine a field. This field, is, we just see you know, the crops and all mm -hmm. this. We don't see any discernible path one point someone decides to walk along that path and if it works and if uh, many other people start walking down this path and eventually we will see a path being formed mm. and he was saying that this could be seen as a custom mm. that we no one started by saying or that person did not start by saying we are going to make this path in this field, it sort of arose spontaneously. Yes. And also we could talk about that. That is going to be an interesting. Well, the, the, there's a great distinction, the, a great way to really, really make it obvious to people is uh, look at an American city compared to an English city. Uh, all English cities are a warren, different streets that have been exactly like the path, you know, for, for hundreds of hundreds of years. Whereas the American cities were all in grid lines. 
and you can tell which one was the rational city and which one was the organic city. Yeah. That, that's the difference. And um, I want to say that also language is somehow spontaneous. Mm. No one, uh, it's not that there was a state of affairs where no one was talking. No. And suddenly someone came, came and said, this is what language is and you are all going to count. It arose spontaneously. Yeah, it's holistic. Yes. And there is an interesting idea as to what, how this gets disrupted how a spontaneous order gets disrupted by a top-down implementation. And I was thinking that if we look from, uh, let's say, a satellite on how people walk, mm. um, we will detect some patterns. Now, these are spontaneously arising patterns. They mm. emerge spontaneously. Now, imagine what would happen if a government started and saying, you and you are going to, if, if they try to detect, to command every step, Mm. There would be chaos. Oh yeah, and the 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 important thing to remember is that um, what people do spontaneously is informed not by a rational calculation, but by an intuitive understanding of the direct environment around them. So it closely maps to the place that they are. Like for example, if you're picking a path through the field, there's going to be a reason that it, it winds in a certain way because there's a, a you know a lump there or a rock there or a, a hole in the ground there or something like that. It's going to wind around it. But if you're a thousand miles away in an office looking at the, you know, the schematics of the field, you'll just draw a straight line because you exactly. don't know, you know, and that's the problem with managerialism. Exactly. And I think that this is also a point that Oakshot makes that mm. is really good is that those who are rationalist in politics, and we will qualify what he means by rationalism, they are really detached and managerial in their perspective. And they forget that they're talking about people. Mm -hmm. in real life concrete circumstances who live in a society that for the most part involves spontaneously arising orders mm. this is Hayek's phrase this is not Oakshot's phrase but I'm just saying no, he's right and he is saying that the very attempt to disrupt this and saying that everything will be uh, implemented top down mm. is going to disrupt the spontaneous forces of society. And I don't think that this is wrong because no, we see right. the deadening of creativity in societies that are strictly managerial. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.